time that I swore I would never go back. I was blind to the truth, didn't know what I had. I was running, I was searching, but every place I turned for healing left me more broken than the last. Take me back to the place that feels like home, to the people I can depend on, to the faith that's in my bones. Take me back to a preacher in a verse where they've seen me at my worst, to the love I had at first. Oh, I want to go to church. Trying to walk on my own, but I'm wound up long.
Hello, this is Second in a Minute, where you can find out what's going on around Second Baptist Church. We're thrilled that you've joined us for online church on this Easter Sunday. He is risen, he is risen indeed. Be sure to check out the church website and our social media platforms to get updates and information concerning services, events, and activities. We are continuing our Annie Armstrong Easter offering emphasis, and this money goes to our North American missionaries. Our goal this year is $89,500. Be sure to watch the video after the announcements. This has been Second in a Minute. I thought a missionary was someone that went overseas or someone that went to a different country. GenSend is a six week or eight week program for ages 18 through 25 to go into a city uh, working alongside of a church plant and do ministry in the context of the city. GenSenders are in New York doing this and Portland doing this and Atlanta doing this and committing to a city and living their lives there. Learning to live your life as a missionary, no matter where your life is. Just having the common goal of sharing, sharing Jesus, I think that really builds bonds quickly and it's literally like we're siblings. Because we are on mission together, Jesus makes us family. I'm from a very small town and I didn't see the extent of homelessness. Being able to bless other people by buying them food or buying them something and being able to build a bond there. God used Jensen to show me what it looked like to relinquish control and to open my hands. When you're giving towards missions, you're giving to students who are gonna, at some point, be doctors, be lawyers, be engineers, and in their field, they're gonna have the mindset of a missionary. They only have to worry about who can I talk to next to tell them about Jesus. You're planting seeds in people's lives that will last for the rest of their life. It changes everything. When people give to missions, it invests in people like me. Good morning, church. It's so great to be with you on this Resurrection Sunday. I just got to tell you, um, this uh, social distancing thing is not good for me. Uh, I love people. I, I wish you were here. You just don't know how much I wish you were here gathered together. But what we're going to do, we're going to gather together in spirit. And we know that we're the church. The church is not a building. And we're here to worship the resurrected Savior. Now, many of you, uh, maybe you're visiting with us today. Maybe through a friend, uh, you were told about our service. Well, we want to connect with you. And normally in our services, you'll we'll have a little card in our worship folder that you'll fill out. But we're going to do it a high-tech way this morning. If you have a phone, text the word CONNECT. Text the word CONNECT to 803 281-4002, and we would again love to connect with you over the last few weeks. There have been many of you that have texted the word, and we've been able to get you some information, but if you want more information about our church, we would love to connect with you. And also, we take prayer requests. Again, you can text the word PRAY to the very same number, 803-281-4002. Again, we've received multiple prayer requests, and we'd love to know what's going on in your life. Life. And to know this, our entire staff takes those prayer requests and we pray over them each week. You know, I think about the resurrection, I think of one word, it's the word hope. Man, you're talking about living in a day where many people have lost hope uh, through sickness, through death, through loss of job, through uncertainty. Uh, God's timing is always best. And I believe today we're got a, we've got a message straight from the Word of God that deals with hope and it couples that with the resurrection. You see, Paul tells us that if we hope in this life only, we would be most pitied. See, I have hope because I know Christ. I live because Christ lives. And I know that regardless of what goes on in this world, and by the way, it's just a temporary journey as we go through this world, there's eternity waiting for me. There's the hope of spending eternity with God and we can do that because Jesus lives. 
So we're here today, we don't serve a dead God, we serve a God who's alive. We serve a God who gives hope, yes, in this life, there is hope in this life, absolutely hope. But I know I'm looking forward to a great and glorious day when he comes again. He comes again and he receives his children unto himself. And man, what a glorious, glorious day that's going to be. I want to pray for us this morning. If you would bow your head right where you are, as literally thousands of Christians pray together right now. So, Father, we come to you. Father, I'm just so thankful that you so loved the world that you gave your one and only son. And anyone who believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. Lord, that's the hope we have today, that there's eternity that has been birthed in our heart because Christ, you have caused us to be born again. And the reason we can live and live forever is because you live. So I do want to pray as we start off for those, maybe they don't, they don't have a hope. Maybe they don't have you. And even those who are Christ followers, maybe in, in the previous days, maybe they've lost sight of the hope that we do have. So I pray this resurrection day that hope would be alive in our souls, that Christ, you would remind us of who you are, you would remind us of what you have done. You will remind us what you are still doing, Lord, as we worship you today. So as we gather together, all of our hearts and our minds attentive to what the Holy Spirit is saying to us, Lord, let us worship you with every fiber of our existence. May we cry out to you today in worship. And I ask these things in the name of our risen Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. Let's sing together, okay? Come on. Hallelujah. He is risen, right?
Hallelujah. Amen.
God, we thank you so much for this gift of life that you've given us. We're so grateful to you for life eternal and all the blessings you have blessed us with so, so deeply. And It's in this season, Lord, it's so common for us to, to give thanks and to be grateful for so many things. But today, God, we're so grateful for you and you, Jesus. Nothing like you, Jesus. Nothing like you ever, nothing like you never. So grateful for my family, grateful for my church, grateful for my friends, and in this season, help us find, help us find you, Jesus, and what you're doing, and to realize you have never stopped, never stopped working. Help us, as you've always been the light in the darkness, help us to be that light, the light that chases away all darkness. God, our thoughts today, this resurrection day, we celebrate, we celebrate you, Jesus, for what you have done. We pray that you bring us out of this. We need your help. So guide us, Lord, today. It's in your precious and holy name I pray. Amen. Amen. Max Anders set, shares a letter that he received from a friend. And in that letter it says, 18 years ago, our son was born. And he was born 
with all types of, of deformities. In that letter, he said that his son was born with only half of his left leg. His right hand was malformed. Lungs were not developed. And Lord only knows whatever else was wrong with him. The doctor came in and he says, don't have any hope because he probably won't live through the night. I went into the chapel area of the hospital and I began to pray, Lord, I don't understand why my son is sick. I don't understand why he has all these things going on. He weighs three and a half pounds, born three months premature, all the other ailments. But Lord, I just pray that you don't take him from us right now. The very next morning, the doctor came in and said, I don't know what happened, but it appears that your son is going to make it. But just understand that he's going to have all types of difficulties the rest of his life. My son spent five weeks in the hospital. He came home. And over the next years, it was excruciating to see what my son had to go through. Every few years, his leg would grow and the bone would protrude through the little stump of his leg and then actually have to go in and saw off the bone. And he went through this time and time again. It seemed like every time I turned around, he was in the hospital. And instead of turning to the Lord, I turned to the bourbon bottle. For 15 years, that's where I f- found my solace. But one morning I woke up and, and I thought, I've been a horrible husband, I've been a horrible father, I've been a horrible friend. And the thought came to my mind, I was going to go into my closet and take a shotgun and put it into my mouth and, and kill myself. But yet the radio was on in our house and I heard you speaking. And you said what I heard many preachers say many times, that God loves me and God has a plan for me. But I was just numb to that because I've heard it over and over and over again. But then you, you said this one phrase and it got my attention. And the phrase was this, the Lord deals in futures. See, up to that point, I didn't see much of a future in my life because I'd blown all the opportunities with my family. But God, somehow in that moment, I, I knelt down in my, my bedroom and, and I began to pray. And I received your your forgiveness. And for the first time really in my life, I experienced hope. And I just look back at my son's life. In the eighth grade, he was actually the number one student in math on all of the East Coast. He went to a competition and he won a scholarship to John Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland. A few years later, he actually competed in another competition. He was the number one student in the nation in geography. He's a junior now in high school, and he still continues to amaze me with his brilliance and what God has done through my son. Last week, I asked my wife, why did you stick with me all of those years when I failed you and I failed our our family? And she said this, I always prayed to God, and I knew that God always deals in futures. Now, what a great message this morning. You know, I don't know what your past is, but I want you to understand that that God can take care of the past. God can actually heal you of your past, and God can give you hope because God is a God who deals in futures. And if there's anybody in the Bible that understood that God deals in futures, it's the Apostle Peter. When you think back to the last week of Jesus' life and and all the narrative, when you read through it and you see Peter, and and Peter was up and down, and and we see Jesus telling Peter that that he was going to deny him three different times before the rooster crowed. And, And you can just picture this, that three different times Peter said, I don't know who this Jesus is. You want to talk about a man who experienced failure? I think when Jesus died... He was buried on that Friday. What those three days must have been like for Peter. How he replayed in his mind over and over and over the opportunities that he had to say he knew Christ. And yet, on three different occasions, he denied even knowing him. Peter, 30 years after that, he pens this letter 
called 1 Peter. I want you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter this morning. And we're going to read. And we're going to read these words that come from the heart of a man who understood what hope was. He understood how God dealt with futures. And you begin looking. I'm going to begin reading in verse number 1 down to verse number Five, And we're actually going to concentrate on verses 3 through 5 this morning. But as we begin to read, for those of you that are watching, I want you to think. Maybe you're at a place where you, you don't have any hope. Maybe you're at a place where you're, you're willing to give up. But I pray through this message that you will experience the God of hope. Jesus Christ who gives hope. Verse 1 says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, and Asia, and Bithynia, who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father by the sanctifying work of the Spirit to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. May grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. As we begin to unfold this passage, you need to understand that our God, he deals in futures. And as we begin to see this, when you look in verse number one and verse number two, you see our Trinitarian God working on our behalf for our salvation to know that God the Father has chosen us, that God has set his affections on us. That's What we see taking place in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And as you you see the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit, that we are sanctified through him, that word literally means that we have been set apart by the Holy Spirit, and that happens because of the finished work of Christ, because Christ gave himself and he shed his blood, and it is through his blood that we have found forgiveness. Now understand this, when we talk about hope, everything that we find hope in relies in our mighty God from beginning to end. Peter sets this beautiful picture of salvation that's rooted in God doing for us what we can never do for ourselves. There are a few things I want us to see about this living hope. Number one, hope is alive because Christ is Alive. Notice this relationship in our salvation that it is a hope, but not just any hope. It's a living hope, and it's a living hope because Christ lives. And we think about hope. Hope is, is anticipating a glorious future based on what Christ has secured for us. Hope is taking the promises of God and resting on those promises of God and knowing that we have future confidence, that we can look to the future with great expectation, knowing what Christ has secured for us. And notice some of the terms that are used in this, that this assurance we have, we have this assurance because of God's great mercy. Look again in verse number Three, blessed be the God, the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy. I love the term grace and mercy. In his introductory remarks, Peter referred to this word grace. And I often say grace is getting what we don't deserve. And mercy is not getting what we do deserve. And I hear people, and there, there have been disagreements through the years in, in different theological circles about whether we can truly have assurance of salvation. There are some that believe that you can lose your salvation. But in this passage, we see that we can't lose our salvation. Because if you believe you can lose your salvation, it's really based on how you gained your salvation. There are many who believe it's by merit. That if I'm just good enough... If I do just enough, I can earn the favor of God and therefore have salvation. But when I'm bad enough, I can lose my salvation because I'm not doing enough good 
to hold on to it. But that's not what we see in the, in the word of God. We see in this word of God, this word grace. Remember, it is God doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. There was nothing good in us, but there was only one who was good, one who was righteous, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And when Jesus went to the cross and he gave his life, three days later, he rose again. He was demonstrating grace to us, but there was also this mercy it was God demonstrating his mercy toward us because we were condemned in our sin. There was nothing that, that reigned in us that was anything that could be considered even close to being righteous. And God did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. This is what mercy is to know that I truly deserve punishment for my sin. I truly deserve to be separated from God forever. But because of God's grace and because of God's mercy, I now have hope. Not only is there this great mercy, but notice the phrase that he caused us to be born again. Again, it is God doing a work in us that we couldn't do for ourselves. The Bible is very clear that we are dead in our trespasses and sin. And there's no power that resides in you or resides in me that can bring anything to life. Only the giver of life, the creator of life, can bring life to that which is dead. And that's what we see Christ doing. And the Holy Spirit of God, I just think that Peter probably was going back to John chapter John's gospel chapter number three when Nicodemus went to Jesus and Jesus used the term and told Nicodemus that you must be born again. How are we born again? It's the Holy Spirit of God and his work that's, that's wrought in our hearts that causes this dead man to become alive and to walk in this newness of life. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new through the power of God. Look down at verse 23 in 1 Peter. We see Peter using the same phrase again. For you have been born again. Not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is, through the living and enduring word of God. See, here at Second Baptist Church, when we worship every week, the central thing that we do is we open up the word of God. And it's through this special revelation of the word of God that God speaks to us. And this word is living and it's active. This word is it, not perishable, it's imperishable. And it's the word of God that lives on. It is the words of God that I heard preached and taught as a young child that God used to bring life. And he calls me to be born again. I love what... The Apostle Paul writes in Philippians chapter 1, verse number 6, For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. God gives us assurance because he's demonstrated his mercy toward us, because he has caused us to be born again. And notice how this happens. It's through the resurrection. The reason I have life is because Jesus Christ is alive. I love what the writer of Hebrews says, chapter 7, verse 25, that he lives to make intercession for us. Think about this, that this morning, the Lord Jesus Christ, he is seated at the throne of God. And he is living to make intercession for us. That means he's willing to speak, he's willing to talk on our behalf. And the reason he lives to make intercession for us is because he does love us. Because he does have a great hope for us. Because he is hope. And when we think about this hope that's alive because Christ is alive, it ultimately comes down to this. I can have future confidence in whatever happens in this life and whatever happens when Jesus comes again. I can have hope in eternity because of who Jesus Christ is. As you continue to look in verse number 4, Peter goes on and says that hope is an inheritance. It's the same word used in the Septuagint to refer to Israel's promised possession of the land. 
That land was Israel's inheritance. And to think that there is a land of promise that we too will inherit. And to know that, yes, that heaven is our inheritance, but even Jesus Christ himself is our inheritance. When you look in verse number 4, our English translation really doesn't show this, but in the original Greek language, there are three different words that are used, and they all begin with the same letter, and they end with the same syllable. And it describes in a cumulative fashion the inheritance that we have and the permanence of that inheritance. Notice the first phrase in verse number 4, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable. That means it, it, it can never perish. It, it's not corruptible. It cannot be destroyed. That, that is the perfect word of God that provides this explanation of this perfect inheritance that was secured by a perfect Savior. And it also will not spoil. It means it's unstained. It's undefiled. It cannot be polluted. That's our inheritance. And also, verse number 3, it says, it will never fade away. It means it will not die. When you look at verse number 23, we read earlier, it's through the living and enduring word of God. And it too is referred to as being imperishable. Now think about this just for a moment. Here's this great inheritance that we have for us. And, and, and the Bible says that it's been reserved for us in heaven. And, and the, th the third thing I want us to see is that this hope is trusting our souls are protected. Now look at, look at the progression. That there's this hope that comes because Christ is alive. He secured this great inheritance for us. It is undefiled. It's imperishable. It will not fade away. And notice what it says here. It is reserved in heaven for us. How is it reserved in heaven for us? Notice the phrase, it is protected by the power of God. I love this phrase. It's actually a, a military term that is used to picture a, a garrison. That God puts around us and, and, and God is protecting our very souls. God is protecting this reservation that's been made for us in heaven. And Paul tells us that we have already been seated in the heavenlies. Isn't that a beautiful thing that we can, by faith, we can trust knowing that this reservation in heaven has been, been made for us. It has been secured. And who did it? Christ did it on our behalf. You think about the, the salvation of our, our souls. Look in verse number 13. Verse number 13 in 1 Peter says, Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only in verse number 5, but in verse, uh, verse number um, Five is it mentioned, and verse number 13 is it mentioned, and also in verse number 7, look, so that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to the result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Any theology, now listen closely, any theology that's worth adhering to must include the second coming of Christ because what we find here there's this salvation that's going to be revealed to us and what we see in this passage we actually begin to see the different tenses of salvation we know that we have been saved this is the past tense of our salvation this is when we talked about justification many of you have gone through the life group lesson over the last month and it's in the book of Romans and how Paul talks about how we have been justified before God and the reason that we are justified before God that means that we have been found innocent is because of Christ's death on the cross when Christ died on the cross cross he who knew no sin became sin on our behalf. That means that he took my sin, that my sin was imputed into his account. But then there's the great grace exchange where Christ's righteousness was imputed into my account. 
Therefore, there was a time in my past that it was through faith, because we find that right here. It is through faith our soul is protected because we came to a place where we trusted God's sacrifice. And it was because of his sacrifice that, that he secured, he bore my sin, so I had been justified. We also are being sanctified. That's the daily work of grace in our lives, that we are being set apart. And that means we are growing in our faith. And as we grow in our faith, there's some, some maturity that comes. And I believe that the more we grow, the more we mature, the more and more and more we become assured of what Christ has done for us. But what we find here. In verse number 5, and verse number 7, and verse number 13, it's the future aspect of our salvation. It's what we call glorification. You, you see, Christ is, is waiting. And, and whether it's through my death or whether he comes again, Christ is, is waiting and he's willing to, to, to make me perfect. There, there's a time that, that I'm going to be delivered from the presence of sin. See, justification says we've been delivered from the penalty of sin because I'm innocent, I'm not guilty. Jesus has, has taken that sin debt upon himself. So, so no longer is the, the penalty of sin. Sanctification deals with the power of sin. Two weeks ago in our life group lesson, we saw how it is through the, the work of the Holy Spirit and how we have been born again. And, and now we're not walking in, in these dead works. And because of that, because of God's Spirit who lives within us, we have the ability to walk in obedience. You see, before Christ... I was not even capable of walking in obedience. But because of Christ in my life, because of the Holy Spirit in my life, and as I die to self daily, and as the Holy Spirit lives within me, I can live a life of obedience. So, so sin no longer has power over me. But oh, there is going to be that day. <laughs> this is the, the future hope that we have, that we will be free from the presence of sin. I, I, sometimes it's hard to even imagine that there's going to be a day that I'm not going to struggle with temptation. That there's going to be a day that we're not going to have to worry about diseases. That there's going to be a day when everything's going to be made perfect. Everything is going to be made whole. You see, if there was ever someone who was an apostle of hope, it was the apostle Peter. Peter understood the, that he was a God of second chances. And think again, he's writing to a people that they were experiencing severe trials. They were experiencing severe persecution. And, and these words are penned by a man 30 years later from his denial. Think about that for a moment. Here's a man who understood what it meant to experience a God of second chances chances but think about this there is a salvation that's ready to be revealed in the last time hebrews chapter 9 verses 27 through 28 says this and inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once and after this comes judgment so Christ also, having been offered once to bear sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin for those who eagerly await him. Make no mistake about it, the Lord's going to come again. And the time is nearer now than it's ever been. And what the writer of Hebrews is saying, and really he is saying what Peter has said three different times, is that for those of us who believe in Christ, have trusted Christ, that we hope for the future. We hope for the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ because he is coming again. And he's coming again and there's going to be a judgment. Now, what's, what's great about this passage, if you notice that he says for us, that we will not be in reference to sin because guess what? Our sin has already been judged. It's been judged because Jesus 
took our sin. Jesus bore our sin. He was our propitiation. He took the Father's wrath. And he bore that in himself. He was atoning for us. He was in our place, a place that none of us could stand. That's the good news for those of us who are in Christ. But I need to tell you, the good news, it includes some bad news. Because I want you to hear me this morning. Please hear me. Man, if you are in Christ, there's hope in this life. There's hope in the afterlife. We live because we are people of hope. But if you don't know Christ, if you don't have a relationship through, through him, if you do not walk with Christ, you've never repented from your sin, the bad news is that your inheritance is not heaven. Your inheritance is not Christ. Unfortunately, your sentence is condemnation. That's the bad news. I want to read a quote for you this morning. I read several years ago, and it made a great impact on my life. It's by Dr. R.G. Lee, and I want you to look at it with me this morning. Dr. R.G. Lee says, A soul lost forever in outer darkness, in the bottomless pit, is a Christless world where there is no God or no hope. A soul hurled by the wrath of God out yonder somewhere beyond creation's boundaries, doomed to wander throughout all eternity in outer darkness where no ray of light shall pencil an image on the walls of hell. Where no friendly hand will ever touch that tired, suffering, tormented soul. Where no friendly voice will ever be heard. Where only the sounds that shall greet those weary ears throughout all eternity will be the mocking and jeering of demons, the groans of the dying, the soul lost forever, doomed to wander throughout all eternity in a bottomless, boundless darkness, sinking down, down forever. I tell you, if only half of what the Bible says is true, it is a terrible place. It breaks my heart to think that there are some people today, man, they don't have hope for today. They don't have hope for tomorrow. Although on the authority of God's word, there's no even hope for the future. Unless, here's the good news, unless you meet this Savior that we call Jesus Christ. You know, why is Easter a big deal? Why is the resurrection such a big deal? Because Jesus is alive. And Jesus, when he went to the cross and he became sin for you, he bore my sin, he bore your sin. When he did that, it was all because he's a loving God. And the Bible is very clear. He is not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to eternal life. And this morning, life is here. It is right before you. And Jesus is saying, come to me. Come to me and I'll give you life. Come to me. I'll give you a do-over. Come to me. There's grace. Come to me. You'll receive my mercy. Come to me and you will have hope not only in this life, but in life to come. Hope is alive. Listen, hope is alive. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, well, pastor, how do I, how do I, Find this forgiveness is so easy. It really is. The Bible is very clear. We repent and we believe. We repent and we believe. Repent means that, that we look at our life and we realize there is no goodness in, in me. There's nothing good. And, and I have this sin debt that I can't pay. But Christ did. And you just say, God, I, I know that I'm dead in that sin. And Lord, I just want you to forgive me. And you know what God does? He takes that sin from us and he gives you his righteousness. And right now, 
If you just ask God to forgive you of your sin and trust that Jesus Christ was the one who took your place on that cross. He bore your sins. He bore the sins of humanity. And if you do that, the Bible says, you will, you will be saved. And maybe you've been a follower of Christ for many years. And maybe there are things going on in your life and Listen, I know there's a lot of fear. I understand there's some anxious moments in a lot of people's lives. I mean, I've talked to, I don't know even how many people this week I've talked to that have lost jobs. But don't you understand that the faith that we have is greater than any disease. It's greater than, than any crisis that comes. It's greater than any war. The faith that we have as believers is a faith of endurance. <laughs> That's what Peter's trying to tell us this morning. That it's an enduring faith. It's a faith that will persevere. And God right now is saying, persevere with me. Trust me through this. So this is what I want to do. I want us to pray today. I'm going to pray first of all for those of you this morning that have already asked Christ to come into your life and to forgive you of your sin and to think for the first time in your life you really have experienced Easter because Easter is all about God taking dead people and and Jesus because he rose and because he lives he can cause us to live again He can cause us to be born again. So, Father, as I come to you this morning, Lord, I just pray for everyone who is listening to this broadcast. Lord, for that individual that has yet to understand that God deals in the futures. For that individual that feels hopeless feels abandoned, feels left out, feels unloved. God, I just pray right now they would just cry out to a loving God to seek that that second chance. Lord, to find eternity. And God, the promise that we just read that by faith, when we do call out on you, Christ, and when we ask for forgiveness, that your mercy comes running toward us And your Holy Spirit causes us to be born again. And it's a living hope that comes into our life. Lord, we're not talking about wishful thinking. We're talking about a God who invades our very soul. Who brings eternity into our hearts. And assures us of the inheritance that we will inherit. That inheritance that's not perishable. It will not spoil. It will not fade away. God, that is mercy at its greatest defined. So all the individual needs to do, whoever you are, the only thing you need to do is say, God, I know I'm a sinner. And I know I need you to be my Savior. Forgive me of my sin. Give me your hope. Jesus become Lord of my life and God I want to pray for your children I just want to pray that you remind them of their hope their hope is it's not in the circumstances of life it's not in our homes it's not in our family it's not in our bank account it's not in our jobs Lord we know all those things are temporary but God there's an enduring faith there's a, a faith that lasts for all of eternity and so God we want to God we want to pray to you and ask that you would just remind us of that hope and God we need to just be reminded that we're not in control of anything but we know the one who is And it's in you, Christ, that we trust this day. And we say thank you. 
Oh, and the blessed promise that we read is right now because you're alive, Christ, you're living to make intercession for us right now. Lord, you hear our prayers right now. And you're going to provide the answer for us. It may not be in this day. It may not be tomorrow. But Lord, ultimately, you'll answer. Because you're a God who answers. You're a God who is faithful. So Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you that we've been able to come before you. Lord, I thank you for those that have given their lives to Christ. We rejoice with them. Lord, the Bible says that there's a great celebration in heaven for anyone who comes to know Christ Jesus. So thank you. Thank you for salvation. And I ask these things in the name of the one who secured our salvation. The one that holds on by the power of God. Thank you. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. I want you to do something for me. If you're watching this morning and and you gave your life to Christ and you were saved we, we use that term because literally that's what it means we have been rescued we have been rescued from sin we have been rescued from hell and we've been given this great inheritance I want to reach out to you I want to talk to you about your decision so if you got your phone out text the word saved S-A-V-E-D text the word saved to the number 803 281-4002 again I'm give you time to write this down find a pencil find some paper text the word saved to 803-281-4002 and maybe you don't know how to do that maybe you're a little old school and let me just give you my email address write this down if you don't want to text the word saved to the number email me Email me to pastor, P-A-S-T-O-R, pastor at, pastor at Lancaster S-B-C, that stands for Second Baptist Church, pastor at S-B-C dot O-R-G, pastor at Lancaster S-B-C dot O-R-G. Man, I'm so glad that, that you've joined us today. It is at this time that we take up our morning offering and so just going to ask you that several ways you can give thank you first of all thank you thank you thank you for your faithfulness you know going into this this crisis I I knew that God was going to be faithful and I knew he was going to be faithful through you I mean there's something about Second Baptist Church that you always rise to occasion and, and just let me tell you this we we're doing great financially uh, just as if we'd been meeting in person. So as you give, again, you can text GIVE to 803-281-4002, 803-281-4002. Or you can do like many of you are doing. You can mail in your tithes and offerings. You can drop them by the church office. Uh, just drop them off. You don't have to, to go very far to drop it off. Just drop it off. And again, just thank you for, for that. Church, you're just so faithful. I mean, it's a great day. I hope you've enjoyed this time together in your home with your family. Just want to encourage you that, that whenever the, the broadcast goes off, why don't you spend some time with your family? Kind of go around the, the living room and, and, and do this. I call it popcorn prayer. Why don't you go around the room and, and tell everybody one thing that you're thankful for. Just, just say whatever it may be, just one thing that you're thankful for. And after you finish going around the room saying some things that you're thankful for, you know, our God is a God who intercedes. He's a God who listens. And maybe there's something you want to ask God for. So just have everybody go around, and maybe there's something that, that you need to pray for together. And ask the Lord to do something for you. And just go before Him and to know He's listening because He's interceding for us. Again, church, it's been so great to be with you. Listen, our Lord is risen, and he is risen indeed. Enjoy the rest of your day. Second Baptist Church, you're sent. God bless you.